So, so this uh, Monday night, there was uh, this ev- invasion that happens a lot of times during this time of year. There was this yellow haze on Monday night that started, and, and Tuesday, and Tuesday night started just penetrating all of Somerville. This, uh, just this yellow haze, yellow haze. And so it, I just want you to know, in Somerville, we don't have purple rain. We have yellow haze. And so as, but here was a, here's what was so cool. Tuesday late that night, we had a downpour of rain. And all that yellow haze, yellow haze was minimized. And my allergies did not kick in like they usually do because of the downpour of rain on that yellow haze. In our personal lives, there's this uh, dark haze that can come in. And when we're in Christ, Scripture shares that God has set us free and that we, all of our sins are forgiven in Jesus. But still, while we're here on earth, the new has come, the old has gone. We are free in Christ. But the challenge is while we're still here on earth, we struggle with that old sinful nature, that old dark haze that comes in. And so uh, what we need is just like the downpour of rain that minimized the yellow haze, we need a downpour of God's presence, the rain of God's presence on our lives. We desperately need, if we're going to drive out the dark haze, those challenges, we need to have that rain of God's presence in our lives. And here's the thing, next year around this time, that yellow haze is going to come right back in. And we're going to need, just like we need the rain to get it out of here, we need the downpour of God's presence. Because next year, that dark haze is going to continue to challenge us in different unique areas. Because of the world system, the devil, our old sinful nature. Thank God we've been set free, but then we got to go in and take it and walk in that freedom. So as you're here today, and we're in First and Second Chronicles, Chronicles, it is crucial. I'm convinced that every one of us, we want a downpour of God's presence in our life. The rain of God's presence. The rain of transformation in our lives. And as we're journeying through First and Second Chronicles, it points to the temple. It points to the life transformation that can take place. What? Because the temple points to Jesus Christ. And as we're looking and journeying together, if you would, go ahead and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 44. The ultimate temple, Jesus Christ, and the temples that we can be as well. Scripture shares here in 1 Chronicles 9, verse 32. Also, some of their kins, kinsmen of the Kohathites had charge of the showbread to prepare it every day. Sabbath. So what we have here is uh, they're talking about the different pieces and furnishings of the temple and and what they did. And and, and as you study scripture, you see how where they point to and and what took place in the temple is that there was there was uh, 12, uh, two stacks of uh, bread looked a little bit like pita bread, two, two stacks of six pieces of bread. That matter of fact, show a picture of kind of like a simulation of the, that's kind of what they're thinking it looked like in the Old Testament. And and so you you had this in the temple, there was this fresh baked bread, and this bread was likely prepared on each Friday and placed in the tabernacle on each Sabbath in two piles of six. It would be replenished each week, allowing the priest to eat fresh bread in the holy place. In the Old Testament, showbread, the, the, the showbread table, as it was cha- placed on there, provides a wonderful picture of Jesus, the bread of life. In John 6, John 6, verse uh, 35, Scripture shares, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. That Jesus is the bread of life. And as you look at the temple in the Old Testament, and each one of the furnishings, it's pointing to God. It's pointing to different characteristics of Jesus Christ. And it, it, it's really so insightful. But when we're looking at Jesus, the bread of life, Matthew 4, Scripture shares that when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, the devil came to him and Jesus responds to him with this. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, uh, meaning, this is pointing to Jesus Christ, the bread of life. And, and what nourishes us uh, experiencing the bread of life is being in God's word. When we each uh, embrace and are in God's word, that, that bread of life refreshes us. It, it, it renews us. And so, you know, one of the popular things uh, for uh, br when you do different bread pieces and uh, the fruit and you got all the nuts and all and you got a little, they call it a, a charcuterie board, okay? I'm sure I butchered it. So I butchered it first service and I had them 10 times in a row outside a couple of ladies were coaching me on how to pronounce it and I had it down and I'm like, I already lost it, I already lost it. So I mispronounced it again. So, but either way, you know what I'm talking about. How many of y'all have done a, 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 a shuck keetery board? Was that right? No. Man. All right. So who, who's done a shuck keetery board? So, all right. Very cool. And, and so, but just as like you, you display all the food on, on a shuck keetery board, it's really neat. It's really awesome. But that's the way we should approach our walk with God. It should be special. It should be not, oh, uh, I got to do it because the pastor says I need to be in the word. No, I, I, I got to do it because it's a Christian thing to do. No, no, no. Make it special. One book called it Desire, Discipline, Then It Turns to Delight. Uh, so let's, let's cultivate this time with God where it's rich, it's nourishing, that we sit at God's presence, the bread of life, receiving from him. Because here, here's the thing, what, what is so important about the Word of God, this is huge. When we come to Christ, God sets us free. We're, all our sins are forgiven. But like that yellow haze comes in, that dark haze c comes in our personal lives. That, 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 those challenges that we'll face, the, 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 the sinful nature, and, and so it's a battle. So how do you fight against it? One, not the only one, but one of the most important foundational things, if it's football, it's blocking and tackling, okay? I mean, if, if it's a, a basketball, it, it's learning how to dribble and put the ball in the hoop and play a little defense. I mean, it's just the basics. you got to be in the Word of God. And because what's going to happen, uh, the, the world gets in to your head and how you counteract that is by being in the word of God so that you, uh, that, that as a reign of God's presence sheds on our life, the way we partner with God to do that is through being in the word. It refreshes us. It renews us. Matter of fact, when I, when I haven't spent time with God in a day or two in this word, I just feel icky. I, I feel off. I, I just... I, there, there's something missing. I'm just off. And, and it, so it, because God meant for us to live supernaturally lives by living in the word of God. And the word of God washes our hearts, our minds, and helps us think God thoughts. So I want us to flip your message notes over, flip it to the back. And, you're, and, and you'll see here, I did one of my soap journals for you. And uh, this is one of the ways that I've learned to uh, attain, uh, retain God's word. And, uh, and as you're looking at that, I soap journaled Revelations 5, verse 5 and 6. And I'm going to coach you in this, but let me show you before I coach you what I have done. Uh, 20 years ago-ish, I started soap journaling, 
And what I have now is 20 years of different notebooks of my personal devotion time where I've spent time with God's word. And this soap journaling part only takes about five minutes, that part. You know, after I, what I do is I read the scripture, read whatever passages of scripture have been speaking to me, and then I'll just write a verse or two that really stand out to me, and I'll put a title up there and the date, and then I'll write out the scripture, which the uh, soap journaling, soaping, you heard our, one of our elders, Chuck Leckie, refer to soaping. Soaping is S-O-A-P, the S stands for scripture, the O stands for observation, the A stands for application, and the P stands for prayer. So for 20 years now, I'll, be, I'll, I'll read God's word, I'll write down a little verse, what it speaks to me, and then I'll write what it says, uh, the, uh, what, what that pastor scripture is sharing, and then the A, how am I going to apply it to my life, and then I'll pray a prayer about that. And so, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk through this pastor scripture in a minute, but this is what I've started doing at the end of the year. Uh, and uh, I also, if I get a little bored, with my time with God, I mean, I just need to shake up the routine. I'm just uh, tired of the, doing it the way I did it for whatever. I shake it up. Just a couple days where I'm like, well, I'll just go back to my soap journal and read what God has been speaking to me uh, the last few weeks. And I'll just reflect on maybe 10, 12 soap journal entries. But at the end of the year, I do a year-end review. This is gold. This will change your life. If you start soap journaling and do what I'm about to recommend, it'll change your life. I do a year-end review now where I'll read back through all of my soap journal. I do other things, too, I reevaluate. And I will put these little stickies on the ones that really stand out to me. And I'm telling you, multiple things that I read, I forgot that God even said it to me. until I'm like, oh, that was so good. Oh, that was so, oh, wow. Oh, wow. And now I can go with the stickies and go right to it. And, and now... It just, what does this do? It helps me retain God's word. It drives that dark haze away. Well, not only that, it helps me pass it on. It helps me pass it on to my kids, my grandkids, uh, people in my small groups. I, uh, Kevin Douglas and I lead a, a Thursday, uh, a Wednesday lunchtime men's group at 1145 in, my church off, in our church office. And we take men through soap journaling. Right now in our, our Wednesday night group that I'm leading, I take uh, with uh, Mike and Michelle. Part of our group, we do a lot of foundational parts. Like this week, it was proof that the resurrection exists. But we also shared soap journal entries. Uh, we do Thursday morning prayer where we're interceding for the church. But we also break it down into uh, about four uh, to five small groups where we discuss soap journaling and pray one for another after we're praying for the entire church. This has changed my life. And 20 years ago, I never journaled, by the way. I never journaled. What, and and you, can, you can call it journaling, but what I like trying to call it is retaining what God has said to you so that you keep it. So I, I just encourage you, if you've thought about it, do some self-journaling. So Revelations 5, verse 5 and 6 shares in the one of the elders, this was the soap journal I journaled. The one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. My observation, the lion has conquered and the lamb has saved us. Application. Live knowing that God is my king and my savior Walk in the fear of God and love of God. We've been working hard on that as a church to walk in the fear of God and love of God. Then my prayer, uh, TFLM means thank, thank you for loving me. Uh, ILYT means I love you too. Makes it a little bit quicker. And then, Lord, help me walk in the fear of you and the love of you. Thank you that you are the lion and the lamb. So I gave you a little sample here to one of the passages that I preached today that you could soap journal personally or your devotion time and just get you a notebook, get you whatever kind of notebook you want to get and start soap journaling. And I believe you, it, it help, help you pass it on 
to other people and retain it yourself. So as we uh, look at this, um, let's continue on in uh, First and Second Chronicles. One other thing, I want to make sure that as we're talking about God's word, I I, want to make sure we don't miss this. Think survival. Think food. Think water. Think survival. It is so important that that's how important God's word is, that we need to be thinking survival. So in Revelations chapter 5 and 6, this really points out what we've been really journeying through a lot as the church, this fear of God and love of God. So in Revelations 5, 5 and 6, when Jesus is referred to as the lion and the lamb, we are to see him as not only the conquering king who will slay the enemies of God at his return, but also as a sacrificial lamb who took away the reproach of sin from his people so they may share in his ultimate victory. To experience the reign of God's presence, we need to be understanding fear of God, love of God, the lion and the lamb, the Chronicles of Christ uh, journey we're on, we're really gonna focus on uh, God being the lion and the lamb, the king and the savior. It's really important to understand God's characteristics of the lion and the lamb. Love of God, fear of God. So as we're talking about Savior, we're talking about the love of God. We're talking about the lamb of God that was sacrificed for our sins. What that means is you're so dearly loved that God loves you, he's forgiven you, That we embrace his love and we embrace the grace of God, okay? But if that's all you have is the, the, you're, you're missing another character trait of God that scripture reveals, which is the fear of God, the, the king, okay, that, that, that fear of God, uh, that the lion, and it, the best way, I know, one of the best ways I know how to communicate it is like this. Uh, let's say um, you blow it, you sin. Um, or, or say, let's just say uh, you, as an adult, you have an adult teenager. And you're adult, uh, adult teenager, you're, as an adult, you have a, a teenager that's uh, junior in high school, all right? And, and they come to you and they say, uh, mom or dad, Listen, I blew it. Uh, I blew it. I sinned. And then you as a parent say, hey, God loves you. God cares for you. Why don't you go, it, it's okay. Don't, don't get down on it. Go ahead and do it again. God forgives you anyway. His grace aboundeth. Go ahead. Keep sinning. Keep, keep on ruining your life because God loves you. It's okay. Okay? Now, God dearly loves you. And God's grace covers all your sins. But that kind of conversation, Apostle Paul says, don't be stupid. Because someone said, uh, do I keep on sinning so that grace may abound? And Paul re- responds with, don't be stupid. And boy, this guy was used of God to write gra- about grace. Uh, wow, amazing. But what he said, I died to sin. How can I live in it any longer? I'm done with that old way of living. So you got love of God, but then you got to have fear of God. He's king. He's the lion of Judah. He's the one that conquers. And so when you have that com- combination of the lion and the lamb, look out. That's when we begin to live this powerful Christian life. Because if you just have lion, king, he's in charge, he's Lord, what do you have? All right, Obey, 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 obey. Slave, I mean, just, uh, we, and that's part of God's uh, character that he wants us to understand. But it's both. 
It's not either or. And so let's, I want us to embrace this series, the Chronicles of Christ, that he is the lion and the lamb, the one that was slain for us. So let's, let's continue on and dive into the uh, passage of Scripture. I'm about to throw this iPad. You're going to, I did something that I knew I shouldn't have done, but this is, y'all don't need to hear me think out loud. Just preach the word. There we go. If any of you want to know, I'll tell you afterwards what. I'll go ahead and tell you. You know how you, usually I have my passcode, but I put my, where's my face? And, you know, it does it by your face. Well, that, that stinks while you're preaching with it. I just want you to know. Because passcode works a whole lot better than, anyway. I know a lot of you know uh, iPads and also afterwards coach me and we'll get it back to what I used to have. So, anyway, let's continue on. In uh, 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. What? Mount Moriah? Where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed. On the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Wow. Keller shares here. The temple is built on Mount Moriah, the place where Abraham almost sacrifices Isaac. But God provides a lamb in the bush. What this means, the knife that did not come down on Isaac but that came down on animal after animal, finally came down on God's son. The temple points to the ultimate sacrifice, to the ultimate priest. Jesus Christ is our temple. He says so. He is the place where we meet with God. And if we rely on him as the ultimate priest, the ultimate sacrifice, we meet God through Jesus Christ, then we become temples. That Holy Spirit, that glory that Moses was not allowed to see, that Elijah was not allowed to see, actually comes into us and we become temples of the Holy Spirit. All of this is indicated in First and Second Chronicles. When Solomon prays and no one can go inside, which we'll look at in a moment, the priest cannot even stand on his feet. Everyone just fell down. That glory comes into you and to me. When I realize that that power of the Holy Spirit that lives in me like this, what excuse do I have not to live this overabundant life in God? The power of God comes within me. That, that presence of God through the Holy Spirit that every one of us, as we've given our life to Christ, and if you haven't yet, man, you need to, because part of being saved, God lives within you, and he enables you to live supernaturally. He enables you to fight the dark haze, that, uh, that, that, that yellow haze, that dark haze of tempting your life. And so each one of us uh, need to be living great lives. We have no excuse. I think we're settling for a whole lot less than what God's called us to live. If we really realize how powerful God is, the Holy Spirit that lives within us, and I want you to know, I, right now I'm so, this is my biggest takeaway. Joey, come on. Come on. Let's get back to it. The Holy Spirit lives within you. Don't you settle for less than all that God has for you. So we'll, we'll look more into this next week. But the temples, this is so, what's so neat about second, first, second Chronicles. The temple sacrifices are not enough. Just as we've been looking at first, second Samuel, first, second Kings, uh, and now first, second Chronicles, as they, no human king would do it, we needed a perfect uh, king in Jesus Christ. The same, the temple points to no temple's going to do it of all those uh, sacrifices that's going to uh, take away our sins. Only it points to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And not only that, as you look at all the sacrificial systems that are going on at the temple in the Old Testament, sin is a big deal to God. Jesus went to great lengths to pay the price for our sins. And so we need to take those sins seriously. So as, as we looked at, and we looked at this when we were in the book of Genesis, that as Abraham 
was tested by God, that would he, uh, when, about Isaac, his son, and, and he, this was his Moriah moment. Was it going to be God's will or Abraham's will? And wow, did God test Abraham. Well, I, I want to ask you a question. I'm asking myself this as well. What is your Moriah moment? I just had this happen to me a, a couple weeks ago. I was meeting with a gentleman, and we were discussing some things. And he said, man, it really came down to it's God's will, not my own will. And I heard him, and this was, that was revelation for him in his own personal life. But boy, it spoke to my core. I realized I had started drifting where it was, it was my will, not God's will in some areas. And I needed to hear that, and I heard it from someone else that God spoke it into their life. But through that, God spoke it into my life. And I'm believing that God is going to speak it into your life today as well. What is your Moriah moment? Where, like Abraham, he chose, it's not my will, but it's God's will. And Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke twenty two forty two 42 shares, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Our Moriah moment needs to be not my will, but your will be done. As we're in the word of God and reigning God's presence on our life, and I believe it drives away that dark haze, those old ways of living. I also believe that There needs to be this moment, this Moriah moment for all of us where God, no more my will, it's your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. Each one of us struggles with this to a certain level in our lives that we're wanting it to be our way, our will. Let's look at the dedication of the temple in 2 Chronicles 7, uh, verse 1. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down, and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground, on the pavement, and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord. For he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. God's presence was so powerful they couldn't even perform uh, their duties because God was it was a special powerful moment in the book in the book Chronicles of Narnia by uh, C.S. Lewis the the character the the lion is a is a um a, a representative of Christ he's called Aslan and there's a moment when they're talking about Aslan and it says he is not a tame lion but he is good. We serve a great God. Really quick, we're going to dive into a lot of this next week, but just a quick little piece of the temple. Uh, And so these are a lot of the furnishings of the temple that we'll look at next week. I just want you to know that all of these point to uh, key things in our lives, like the outer court praise and thanksgiving the brazen altar, the cross, the laver cleansing, the candlestick, the Holy Spirit, table of showbread, the word of God, altar of incense, worship and prayers of the saints, holy of holies, the ark of the covenant. So let's move, and we'll look at that more next week, but let's move to the New Testament and look at Jesus in the temple. So uh, the the kids in kids ministry went over this uh, portion of scripture last week it was really cool I was in k4 class they had a glow in the dark thing where uh, they, they had glow sticks and all that while they were singing this little light of mind and and then they were going over this part and I want you to know this k4 class the, especially the boys I was noticing man they like the whip and Jesus driving out the sin man and they were getting it I asked them the question uh, at the table I was at hey what, what's this oh uh, Jesus driving out the sin with that whip you see that and I was like yeah get, let's get it all right and so there's actually, so as Jesus is driving out the sin um, of the temple in our lives, we're temples of the Holy Spirit. We want the reign of God's presence in our life. We need to drive out the sin in our lives. Just like Christ drove out the sin, we need to drive the sin out. And as Christ cleanses the temple, he is wanting to cleanse us. So as he drove them out, it, 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 the Jews said to him, 
Uh, Jesus, uh, they share this. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Who's he referring to? J- scripture says. Uh, verse, uh, he goes on and he says, uh, verse uh, 22, but he was, verse 21, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. So each one of us need to take sin seriously. And what was the sign that he had was, uh, was going to be, uh, of that who he was, that he was the Messiah? The sign was that he was going to be raised from the dead after the third day. And that's exactly why we, wanna, as we celebrate Easter, we're going to be celebrating the resurrection of our Savior. Three days is powerful. So if we want it's powerful about the, what God did in our lives through the resurrection. If we want the reign of God's presence in our life, we need to make sure that we really grasp deeper and deeper, and I'm wanting us to do this the rest of our lives, of lion and lamb, understanding who Christ is. He's the lion of Judah. He's the lamb of God. He's Savior and King. Love of God fear of God. We got to also make sure that we are in the word of God, the reign of his presence in our lives in a powerful way. We need to make sure we come to the place where it's not my will, but your will be done. And we need to embrace that God uh, wants to drive out the sin of our temple, that he doesn't want us to deal with low living. We all blow it. We all make mistakes, but he's king. He forgives but he also wants us to live in a life abundantly so sin doesn't rip us off. Let me give you one more of the reign of God's presence in its worship. I've asked Dakota to come out and lead us in a worship song. And it's all about, it has some Old Testament descriptive language, but y'all understand that's all pointing to Jesus Christ. And as we go into this song, I want us all to move into another place of worship before God. I, we need the reign of God's presence to drive out that yellow haze. That dark haze needs to be driven out. And one of the most powerful ways is praise and worship. There's been many times where I've been depressed. There's been many times where I've been discouraged. And one worship song, and that dark haze is gone. And I feel like I'm experiencing the reign of God's presence. If you haven't pushed in the praise and worship of, of really seeking the Lord's presence, I encourage you today, let this be another breakthrough for you. If you have, man, lean in. Lean in. And let's stand up and let's worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Father, we love you. And Lord, I'm praying right now that the reign of your presence would consume us, Lord. God, we need your fire. We need your presence. We need your strength. We need your love. God, thank you that you are the lion and the lamb, the king and the savior. God, help us to love you and fear you, God, that you are Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said together, amen.